Hello, everybody. This is Matt Hardy, Program Director for Planning and Performance Management here at AASHTO. Uh, to all of you joining us on the line, on the web, welcome. This is our uh, webinar 48 in our Transportation Asset Management webinar series that has been sponsored by FHWA and, FHWA and AASHTO, I think, almost for the past eight or nine years. We're coming upon 50, uh, the Diamond um, Anniversary, and we'll do something special for that one, I promise. Uh, this is also the third in a five-part mini-series uh, that has been taking place. The purpose of the mini-series is to take a deeper dive into the topic of improving your next uh, state DOT TAMP, your Transportation Asset Management Plan. We've been delivering these uh, mini-series webinars more frequently in order to build momentum and increase engagement uh, with, the, with the state DOTs and other transportation agencies. The next two in the mini-series will be held next Wednesday, February 10th, and the following Wednesday, February 17th, both at 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, the topics are improving life cycle planning and management and improving risk management and resiliency, respectively. I also want to say that next Wednesday, uh, February 10th, the joint meeting of the AASHTO Subcommittee on Asset Management and the TRB Asset Management Committee will be taking place. Uh, these, these meetings typically take place uh, the second Wednesday of each month uh, from, I want to say, one, <laughs> I'm forgetting now, uh, one to two or, or something like that. But next week, uh, we are going to move them an hour uh, earlier uh, to 12 p.m. to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time to deconflict uh, with, uh, with, with, with this uh, mini-series uh, webinar. If you're interested in joining, if you're from a state DOT and you want to join the Subcommittee on Asset Management and learn more about what we do, feel free to send me an email and I will put you on the uh, distribution list so you can uh, be part of those, of those recurring meetings. Um, same thing from the Asset Management, from the TRB perspective. So if you want to join in, it's an open sandbox, uh, you're, you're welcome to join us. Um, but I just want to sort of point that out. Uh, so back in December, our last webinar provided an overview of transportation asset management plan development and approaches to TAMP improvements. We heard from some uh, great speakers and did some quick response polling as part of that session. If you missed it, I encourage you to look it up on the AASHTO TAM portal. Uh, there you will find more information on this webinar series and a whole host of other webinars that we've done over the past eight, nine years. Uh, just visit tam-portal.com and click on TAM events in the main menu. Again, tam-portal.com and click on TAM events. And I also want to say that we are doing a refresh of the TAM portal, integrating it uh, better uh, with our TPM portal and our enterprise risk management portal. More about that later on. Uh, you can also register at the TAM portal uh, for upcoming webinars as they are announced, and you will find archives of all of our previous webinars um, going back to webinar number one. Uh, links to the video and slides from today's webinar will also be posted to that site, and I will also say that uh, it, within the GoToWebinar functionality under Downloads, you can uh, download the uh, slide deck that, that, that is being used today. If you have any suggestions on future webinar topics or have questions for the presenters during today's webinar, please submit your comments or questions using the webinar's Q&A feature. We will answer all of the questions that we can during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Uh, we are leaving extra time for Q&A today and are looking forward to your questions. So as they come up, please type them in um, and we will sort of get them in the queue. If we can't address all of them, we will uh, uh, we we are going to record all of those questions and we'll be able to get back to you uh, with answers. Uh, for now, I want to turn it over to my good friend Steve Gay uh, from FHWA, who's been a great partner um, in these webinar series over the past again eight nine years, um, and uh, you know again great partner uh, working at FHWA. So Steve, over to you. Hey, thank you, there, Matt. Hey, I'm really excited about doing this mini series with you. You know, sometimes we got to talk about what else we can be doing. You know, and advancing the asset management, I'll say one step further, as you get ready to get those next camps. You know, the certification in 2022, busy time right now, thinking how do we move ahead. You know, one thing I'll say up front is, in your state DOTs, have others who you want to have involved look at your previous camps. And have you asked them for ideas of, hey, what do you think we ought to be doing? You know, it's Federal Highway is a proud sponsor of this webinar series in cooperation, Matt, with you all at Ashton. And this is 
first and foremost, an opportunity to share good, practical, useful, timely information with the entire asset management community. I'm glad to see so many of you returning from previous webinars, and we're looking forward to seeing you in the rest of the mini-series and on from there. We have a great program for today's webinar with the goal of this new mini-series focusing on improving your net end. Taking a look at what you had in the last one and some ideas here, some considerations. How can you make this next camp a little better? Uh, financial plans are a very important topic when it comes down to asset management, and we think this session will be useful and informative. As you know, the next cycle of camp development is right around the corner. You've already heard from some states there procuring contractors, they're already having meetings, etc., with those next set of TAMPs. The financial plan is a critical component of the TAMP. It's about the money. We'll hear today from practitioners who will share some of their experiences and insights. We'll also hear from the consultant team behind a couple of valuable guides being developed or developed to help you advance the state of the practice. I think you're going to enjoy today's presentation and discussion, and I hope we'll all learn a lot this afternoon. I'm, I'm certainly looking forward to it. And so now, we're going to turn it back over to Matt Hardy to cover our agenda and objectives for today's webinar. Matt? Great. Thank you, Steve. Um, one thing I forgot to mention um, in the opening comments is that there is going to be a final session, uh, a final webinar. So FHWA took a look at all the uh, asset management plans. Um, they did a TAMP review, um, and we're going to be scheduling a, a session called TAM Maturity Levels from FHWA's 2019 TAMP Reviews. We're going to be scheduling that one soon. Uh, we will get the information out as soon as we do, and we will post um, the uh, uh, an opportunity to sort of register and, and everything for those at the TAM portal at tam-portal.com. So for today's webinar, uh, the purpose of today's webinar series is to share lessons learned, ideas, and knowledge with the asset management community. Uh, for this webinar specifically, the primary learning objectives are one, building uh, working knowledge of key concepts and definitions related to the TAM financial plans, and two, beginning to apply this knowledge in order to answer the following questions. What opportunities exist to strengthen TAM financial plans and to improve the next TAM that has to be developed in 2022? What benefits can my agency expect by strengthening the asset management financial plan? And finally, what are key lessons learned from the first round of TAM development that could help improve TAM financial plan and the next TAM? We're hoping that you'll use this webinar, again, use the webinar Q&A panel to share your questions for the presenters um, on these and other topics today. So for the agenda, let's move on to that. First, we're going to have William Johnson is going to kick off the webinar with a topic introduction. Next, we'll have Bill Robert of Spy Pond Partners. After Bill, we'll have uh, Matt Harbert from Iowa DOT, and then Dave Schwartz of Kansas DOT will conclude our presentations today. So just another reminder, please submit comments uh, and questions using the GoToWebinar Q&A functionality. Uh, we will see those questions and we can put them in the queue. Don't feel like you have to wait until after somebody uh, presents to type in your question. Just do it whenever you want to. Um, and in response to the most frequently asked question, yes, we will make the slides and video available after today's webinar at tam-portal.com. Again, I'm not sure if I've said this enough, but it's tam-portal.com. And now let's get started with today's program. William Johnson, until recently on special assignment to FHWA, uh, is, works at the Colorado Department of Transportation, and will get us started with an overview of the TAM financial plan and the benefits and importance of improving your financial plan. With that, I'll turn it over to William. Yeah, thanks, Matt. And, you know, as you mentioned, I just recently completed a year plus assignment to FHWA. Normally, I'm the Performance and Asset Management Branch Manager for Colorado DOT, where I lead, uh, my title is one of the more descriptive titles, I lead performance management, asset management, and strategic initiatives for the department. <clears throat> um, in waxing poetic about the financial plan, what I like to say is outside of just having a basic inventory of your assets, uh, Steve said, that, hey, we're gonna be talking about some important stuff with the financial plan. There is nothing more important than a financial plan within your transportation asset management plan. 
it is the soul of your trans of the, your your TAM. Um, what I mean by that is it is the document that brings together your inventory, your work types, your investment strategies, the risk management, the money, the performance measures, the targets into one comprehensive piece, one single chapter within your TAM, so that from bottom up or top down, everybody knows what you're trying to accomplish with asset management across your department. Some of the things that we need to ask when we're developing our new TAM, which uh, by the way, your new TAM is gonna be due next year in 2022, is one, how are you using asset valuation? Now, things like asset valuation may seem like one of those compulsory things, but honestly, the things that you put within your, your financial plan, you have to look at them as components, tools to be used in both developing and implementing asset management. The next one is, who are you including in the development of your financial plan section within your TAM? What I mean by that is, uh, through some of the surveys that we've asked, either through the TRB annual meeting or some of the past webinars, TAMP implementation and more so who's involved in the development of the TAMP still remains uh, one of those challenge areas for DOTs. Now, the financial plan, again, the, the heart and soul of your TAMP, it's one of those things where are you talking to the planners? Are you talking to your budget staff? Are you talking to your region or divisional engineers? Uh, of course, naturally, you should be talking to your individual asset managers, but those are the people who should be contributing towards your financial plan section. But more so, when you're done developing your financial plan, it's the thing that you use to communicate broader. Here is our game plan. This is why we spend money. This is what we're going to spend money on. And when we spend that money, here's what we plan to achieve. The other thing you should consider is funding stream changes, your revenue. So COVID has been an interesting time, but don't think of revenue changes as being COVID specific. If you have an emergency event, specifically regional, large events, they could shift money quickly the effect of connected automated vehicles, electric vehicles, is going to have an effect on your revenue streams probably sooner than you're thinking. How are you taking into account potential, the threat of revenue changes within your financial plan? Other considerations. Other considerations would be, well, what else is going on in the future? Are you seeing growth in MPO areas? more than in your rural areas? Uh, are you seeing more trucks uh, that are going to be appearing on your road because, I don't know, maybe there's a new farm or a new gravel pit, or in some cases, a new Amazon mega warehouse? What are those changes that you have to think about that will be occurring in the future? And then, of course, other performance areas. In a sense, your TAMP is supposed to be a document that ties in PM1, safety, PM2, which is the asset management, as well as PM3, the system performance. How does your financial plan address those other performance areas? One way to look at that is, well, we have these work types, and through work types, there is new construction, but the rest is asset management. But as a DOT, you do many other things. What is happening in terms of ops? What is happening in terms of other maintenance activities that are not directly related to asset management, but could have an effect on the other performance areas that we have for the feds. I'm gonna end this with a reminder of training and webinars. Now, NHI has done a great job in putting, transitioning all the training for the asset management stuff to the web. And specifically, I want to point out NHI course 136002, which is financial planning for asset management. And with that, I encourage you, if you are developing the TAMP, take it. If you have staff that are going to be involved in developing the, the TAMP, please encourage them to take it. If there are staff that are responsible for the implementation of TAMP uh, or 
who are involved in providing you information to put into the TAMP, please encourage them to take it. In my mind, um, in, in having gone through this in Colorado, it was the one piece of training that best got the organization on board with asset management. The other thing, and Bill Robert from SpyPon will be talking about this, is NCHRP Guide 898, which is the Guide to Developing Financial Plans and Performance Measures for Asset Management. That's released, it's out now, so please reference it. The other one is NCHRP 2306, Developing an ASHTO Guide to System Level Asset Valuation in support of TAM decision-making. Again, how are you using that asset valuation? Uh, last on the training is, of course, the TAM guide, which is available on ASTO slash, or, sorry, TAM slash portal. I almost messed it up with you, Matt. TAM slash portal. And you can access the latest ASHTO asset management guide there. And what I'd say is, I know, Matt, sorry, I blew it. At least I'm not blowing dates. I'm just ignoring dates. Um, the next two TAM webinar mini series is going to be very important. I believe the next one is on risk management. Please attend that. Following that, as Matt Hardy had said earlier, is going to be the summaries on the 52 TAMs, that FHWA project. Um, that is probably going to be one of the most important webinars that we have this year. And I'm hoping beyond DOTs that NPOs, consultants will be able to participate in that too. So I'm going to hand it back to Matt and thank you for your time and I hope you enjoyed the show. Great, thanks William. Um, that was great, uh, great introduction. Uh, as some other people are speaking, I will try to type in the chat there uh, links to the resources that uh, William talked about. Uh, but before that, um, up next, uh, well, as, a, as a reminder again, I'm not sure if we're saying this enough or not, but if you have questions, uh, please type them in the Q&A functionality. Um, our next presentation is from Bill Robert. Uh, he's a vice president at SpyPond Partners, has over 25 years of transportation um, and transportation asset management experience. He led NCHRP Project 19-12, uh, a guide to developing financial plans and performance measures for asset management. And that is now published as NCHRP Report 898. If you don't know your NCHRP lingo, again, I'll try to post some links and everything in the chat um, that you can get access to these. And then currently is leading uh, NCHRP Project 23-06, a guide to computation and use of system level valuation of transportation assets. And he'll be discussing both of these today. And he has just the the best background, I think, compared to mine with a nice bookcase and everything, looks very, very smart and sort of put together as opposed to me. Um, I have issues with that, but I guess. <laughs> Anyways, uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Bill. Thanks, Bill. Uh, thanks very much, Matt. So I'm going to talk about two NCHRP projects, uh, one that has been completed, uh, NCHRP Project 1912, and one that is still underway, NCHRP Project 2306. Uh, so first up, uh, I'll, uh, I'll summarize uh, project 19-12. So this project is, was uh, called Developing Financial Plans and Performance Measures for Asset Management. It's published as NCHRP Report 898, and obviously it's, it's closely related to the, uh, the issues that we're talking about in today's webinars. So I'll, I'll spend a few minutes just talking about that project and what's in, uh, in the report, and also talking about the supporting tool that was uh, prepared to go along with the research. So um, NCHRP report uh, 898 was motivated uh, by um, a desire uh, to, uh, to detail the procedures that the transportation agencies can use to conduct their financial analysis and develop financial plans specifically in support of transportation asset management. Um, it's intended to guide agencies in meeting their federal requirements for TAMPs and other federal requirements, um, but it's intended not strictly to be a guide to, to compliance, but also a guide to, kind of, to best practice in this area as well. And the guidance is, is certainly focused on state DOTs and their needs, but it's intended to be applicable to all transportation assets. Uh, not just pavements and bridges. Um, so the the report, Report 898, does detail uh, the results of the research, presents the guidance, 
it also describes uh, a set of uh, field validation efforts with Colorado DOT and um, Minnesota DOT. In Colorado and Minnesota were both uh, represented on our project panel, had a, had a great panel um, of, of different folks who were very engaged with the research. And we uh, were able to um, get assistance from those agencies to, to test the guidance. And, uh, and that's described in the appendix. And um, those states' experiences also woven into uh, to the actual document. Um, and I should say that we had a great team of folks who worked on this report. Um, SpyPon did lead it, but we had a lot of support from KPMG, uh, as well as from University of Texas at Austin, in addition to our panel. Um, so this slide just shows an overall perspective on um, financial planning as a, for asset management. And, um, and really what, what it's showing is that the financial plan, it's a long-term document, should span 10 years or more, showing um, what your resources are, what money, um, potentially other resources you have available, what your projected expenditures are on your assets, and any condition targets or other targets um, for the assets. It should include strategies, needs, shortfalls, and policies that, that relate to um, asset management over, over the, the, the period. And really, the financial plan, it supports asset management, but it also reaches into other areas. And here in the figure, you see uh, that the, financial, the, the asset management financial plan relates to planning and programming, as well as to engineering and maintenance. Report 898 uh, is organized around a set of key steps in developing a TAM financial plan. And, and there's a chapter for each of the steps um, labeled on this figure. Uh, one, identifying funding sources and uses. Two, forecasting funding. Three, defining investment strategies and scenarios. And four, estimating asset value. And I'll, I'll just briefly address um, each of these areas. Um, so the first um, step is to uh, document sources and uses of funding. And this, this is a requirement for developing an asset management plan, for developing the financial plan in your asset management plan, but it's, but it's also consistent with good practice. So we go through in the guide and, and describe how this is done and provide examples from a number of different agencies um, I believe we use Colorado or it could have been Minnesota is one of the examples. I, uh, I wouldn't swear to it, but we do have some examples in there of how different agencies have uh, gone about identifying their sources and uses and showing that in their plan. So basically the steps here are, you know, figure out what the scope of the TAM program is. Does it cover just capital expenses or does it, does it also cover uh, asset maintenance expenditures, what assets are included. Uh, then figure out where does the money come from? What are the sources of money? Um, and then what, what are the uses and how should they be stratified? How are they categorized? And that seems simple, but there's, there's obviously a lot to it. So then you structure the, the lists, lists of sources and uses and validate the list and then, um, and then document it. The next big area covered in Report 898 is on forecasting revenues and expenditures. And this is, this is a challenging area because every, every DOT, every transportation agency has to forecast their available funding and they have to forecast their available expenditures. But often the person who's in charge of revenue forecasting is not the asset manager. It could be in a small agency, but it's often somebody else. So, this, this step really involves engaging a lot of different people in an, in an agency. Um, and so the steps here are first figure out roles and responsibilities. Who's, who's responsible for revenue forecasting? Who's responsible for establishing the key parameters that um, contribute to the revenue forecast, such as uh, fuel consumption or ridership in the case of transit agency, um, the cost indices, and and, and so forth. So all these factors are important. You have to figure out uh, who's responsible. Uh, then review prior forecasts, do the forecasting, 
And um, in the document, we talk about uh, the distinction between forecasting uses of money for asset management and also other non-asset management uses that you may end up showing in the plan just to, to try to present a complete picture of where the money, what money you have and where it's going. Um, and then finally, you figure for uh, all your, your funding, what's available for asset management and you document some of the key assumptions. And this one, we, we had some, in all the chapters we had examples, and this one I think we had a, a great example from Minnesota DFT talking about how, uh, how they uh, project their, their funding. And I think one of the challenges we saw in this area is that, uh, like I said, all agencies have some sort of revenue forecasting, but in many cases, um, the revenue forecasts don't extend out 10 years or didn't extend out 10 years before people started working on the TAMPs. So figuring out how to address the full 10 year period covered by a TAMP was certainly a big issue for a lot of agencies. The next big step is defining investment strategies and scenarios. So, um, so this this is this is certainly a tricky area. This is one of the longer chapters of the document. So you just kind of go through. Well, what does it mean to define an investment uh, strategy or an investment scenario? And we talk about different approaches for defining those specific scenarios and for evaluating the scenarios. And and really, to this step is supported by an agency's management system. So they're, depending on what systems you have available and how they function that might guide um, how you go about this step. So one approach is to rely heavily on management systems and look at different funding scenarios for payments or bridges or facilities or other assets. Uh, another kind of basic strategy is to work in more of a bottom-up way where you have specific investments that you're considering and kind of build up a scenario that consists of a of a specific set of projects or investments. And, and we also describe in this chapter that a lot of agencies are somewhere in between and they, and they use different tools and different strategies. Uh, and that, that's what makes this all so complicated. So, but basically the steps here are define investment scenarios, identify uh, any current or planned projects, things that are already on the books to the extent that they would impact your scenarios. Um, use the management systems uh, to the extent you got them, to predict future conditions, do some sort of an initial assumption, initial budget allocation, and then within that, um, select investments and refine the predict predictions of future conditions, and then iterate essentially until you've got a, uh, a scenario for how, uh, for the future, for how things might look. Um, okay, and then the the last big chapter uh, in the guide is on asset valuation, and this is also the the subject of the project I'm going to describe next. So um, here it's one chapter of a larger guide, and we talk about um, the steps for calculating asset value, um, specifically to support an asset management plan. And the basic approach we describe in this document is uh, first look at what your agency has established. Uh, for its financial reporting, and for financial reporting in the U.S., financial reports would be prepared using um, GASB 34. Uh, so look at that value. You may or may not use that value, but it's it's certainly good practice to look at it. Uh, often the GASB 34 estimate of asset value is well, it's always based on historic costs, uh, which can be an issue for asset management. Uh, it's often also based at, at a pretty high level, so it may not be broken out if you're plan is for national highway system assets, the GASB uh, asset value calculation may not be at that level. It may, it, may, uh, it may value roadways generically without uh, distinguishing between different assets. So it, it all depends on uh, the agency. But, it, but any public agency um, has to do financial reports, and in the U.S. they have to use GASB 34 to support that. So anyway, so look at the GASB 34 value. Uh, in this guide, we recommend calculating a depreciated replacement cost um, to support asset management. We describe how to do that, and then essentially decide, you know, what data to present in your asset management financial plan, whether 
you just show a depreciated replacement cost. You show the value from the financial report or both. Um, in any case, you, you, it's also important to document the calculation and incorporate that into the 10-year financial plan. And all these topics, I mean, there's a lot to them. And uh, we have a lot of examples and so forth in the guide. Um, and so I encourage you to, to take a look at that if, if any of this is of interest to you. Um, to go along with the guidance, we did develop a web tool uh, called the TAMP Financial Planner. This was developed as part of the research effort, uh, but um, Ashto was generous enough to, to offer to, to host this tool on a, at least, uh, you know, on an ongoing basis, at least, for, you know, at this point. Uh, so that tool is out there and it's at www.tamplanner.com. It's available for public agency use. And it is a web tool that helps walk, helps walk you through the tools in developing a financial plan and supporting TAMP development. Um, it, you know, it, it can help structure your sources and uses, track financial projections. Uh, it can do an asset value calculation and, and it has some um, charts and graphs for visualizing results. I think it's, it's useful in particular for that last, um, for that last application for looking at results. Um, these are a couple of results from the, from the, the tool. Uh, so this is a Sankey diagram. It shows um, sources on the left and uses on the right, and you can have programs or funds in the middle, but basically helps document, you know, wh where's the money coming from and where is it going? And there's some great examples of these kinds of visualizations in, in some of the plans out there and in some of the other agency documents. Um, Caltrans has a fantastic flow diagram like this in their documents on, uh, on, on their finances. Uh, this is just an example bar chart showing revenue forecasts and then a pie graph uh, summi summarizing sources and uses. So uh, as I said, the report is out there, the tool's out there, and um, encourage everybody to take a look at these, these resources. Uh, but at this point, I'm going to pivot and talk a little bit about an ongoing project, uh, NCHRP Project 2306, on uh, asset valuation. And uh, this project is being performed by Spy Pond with, uh, with HDR and KPMG. Uh, so the objectives of the research are to uh, detail procedures for calculating asset value to support asset management. And it's um, our, our intent here is to get a guidebook and have it be applicable to highway and transit. Uh, the guide will have, you know, basic terminology, different methods one could use, um, including the depreciated replacement cost method that we that we do uh, recommend in, in Report 898, as well as other methods. And um, the, it'll be a printed guide, but it'll also be a web-based. There'll be a web-based version of it. And in working with our panel, we've the panel's put a high priority on trying to make sure this guide uh, meshes well with complements the uh, Ashto Transportation Asset Management Guide. So, um, so this research is now underway, and um, so we're in the the initial stages of of developing our our framework for asset valuation and starting to write the guidance. And you know, one key. So, just talk about a couple of key issues from the research and. Um, and then, and then leave everybody hanging as they wait for us to, to actually produce, you know, finish the research. But so, you know, one key issue in this research is that there are a lot of different applications for for asset valuation, and um, you know, initially, what a lot of agencies, uh, ha the reason that agencies first develop asset value calculations is to support financial reporting, and. Um, but there's also a variety of asset management applications for calculating asset value uh, that that are related to financial reporting, but a little, but in some cases a little different. So for asset management, um, it's certainly um, useful to communicate what are the conditions of your assets and what what money do you need to spend to maintain the condition and to maintain the value. Um, asset value can be used to help support investment decisions. Like how much money should we spend and what should we spend it on? It can be used to monitor the effectiveness of a maintenance plan. 
you know, we spent all this money uh, on rehabilitating these assets, or maintaining these assets, what do we get for them? Uh, it can be a tool for, for helping develop investment strategies. It can also be a way of kind of tracking uh, what's happening to your assets over time. So there's a lot of different applications of asset value to support asset management, uh, as well as kind of basic financial reporting, which is also uh, extremely important. One of the things that we're grappling with in the research is that there are different perspectives on what asset value is. And your perspective, you know, where you stand depends on where you sit. And uh, your perspective on what asset value is depends a little bit on your role. It also depends on what the application is. And depending on the application, you may want to adopt one or the other perspective. So this diagram shows um, three perspectives, a cost perspective, a market perspective, and economic perspective. And all of these are valid, and there may be good reasons for, for any of these, uh, for, any, for using any of these perspectives to calculate asset value. Usually for asset management, we're concerned with the cost perspective. What does it take to construct and maintain an asset? What, what does it cost the agency? But for some assets, um, like a vehicle, um, a market perspective may be more um, more valuable, you know, or more meaningful. Uh, if if there is a market for the asset, what can I sell it for? I mean, that's what we look at, you know, when we're getting ready to use cars. So um, so that's certainly that's consistent with best practice internationally. Is where if you have a market, use the fair value or use the market value uh, of the asset. Uh, but for some applications, really, it's necessary to take an economic perspective. What what value does the asset provide to society? So if we're looking at whether or not we should build an asset to begin with, we don't. We're certainly concerned with what it costs to build it, but we're more we're also concerned, I should say, with with what will the asset do? I mean, how will it enhance mobility? Uh, so that that perspective is important for certain applications as well. So we have to deal with all these perspectives in the research. Um, so just a couple more slides on this project. Um, the steps in calculating asset value, essentially this would be a much more detailed version of what's on, in the asset value chapter in report 898. So we'll talk about how to define the analysis scope. So that, that's defining what assets you're interested in and what systems are you are you interested in figuring out what the initial value of an asset is and, and that's what depends heavily on your perspective uh, another key thing is figuring out the depreciation approach assets lose value over time uh, and you have to figure out how do you measure that loss of value um, and it could be just based on the age of the asset it could be based on the condition of the asset it could be based on how the benefits that the from the asset get consumed or used over time. Um, so you know, so that's really important is to figure out how you're going to depreciate. Uh, you also have to figure out what treatments you're considering and how they play into it. How does um, how does performing rehabilitation work on the asset affect uh, its value? Um, does does maintenance work? Does it, does it, do we count that? Or is that, is that kind of baked in? Uh, so that's important. And then you have to calculate value and then apply and communicate the results. So one thing we are gonna do uh, in this is provide options. So this is an example flowchart, it's very much draft, just sort of illustrating uh, the decisions about calculating initial value. Um, and depending on your answers to various questions, you might decide to use a historic cost of building the asset, a uh, market value, or a placement cost, or an economic value. And this is just an outline um, of the guide. Again, this is draft. We're, we're our panel's reviewing our proposed outline, so uh, and we still need to write all the chapters. But we anticipate having chapters uh, on each of the, the steps I outlined a little bit earlier. So finally, we've got a couple of different uh, valuable, hopefully valuable, uh, NCHRP projects out there that uh, to help support financial planning for asset management. Report 898, which uh, provides guidance on financial planning for, for asset management, and that one's done, includes this web-based tool, and NCHRP Project 2306, which is ongoing, 
uh, which will provide a more in-depth guide on calculating asset value. Uh, and I should say on that on that second project, uh, right now our schedule for completing the research is is that we should complete it in 2021, which suggests that you, as soon as you would get um, some results out, it would probably be sometime around this time next year. So with that, thanks very much, and I'll turn things back over to Matt. All right. Thanks, Bill. Um, next up, oops, sorry, let me get my little script here. Uh, next up, we have uh, Matt Hobart from the Iowa DOT. Matt is the Transportation Asset Management Administrator at the Iowa Department of Transportation. In addition, he's also chair of the AASHTO Subcommittee on Asset Management. And as he gets his presentation going, um, again, as a reminder, the Subcommittee on Asset Management will be meeting next. Wednesday, February 10th, uh, from 12 to 1.30 p.m. Eastern. And if you're interested in that, you can send me an email. I will post my email in the chat so everybody has it. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to Matt. All right, thank you very much, Matt. Uh, pleasure to be here. Thanks uh, for having me and um, um, uh, great to see uh, uh, a big audience here uh, this afternoon for, for these presentations. I'm actually gonna Pick up a little bit on the on the thread that uh, uh, Bill was uh, discussing a, a minute ago in that project on asset valuation. I'm going to focus on uh, some some of the approaches that we've used for asset valuation at uh, at Iowa DOT um, and um, where we're kind of heading with that. And that'll be kind of the main focus of, of my comments here this afternoon. Um, as uh, Matt mentioned, um, uh, do chair the the uh, Ashto Subcommittee on Asset Management, and we definitely uh, invite every, everyone on the call to, to participate in our, our monthly um, joint calls with the TRB Asset Management Committee and hope to, hope to see you there. Uh, diving in here today, I'm gonna give a little bit more about kind of how does Iowa approach the GASB 34. So Bill talked about that a couple of times in his uh, comments. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about how we actually do that, uh, then how we looked at how we value our assets. Um, with respect to the asset management plan, then some work we've done related to project selection, and then some future work that we're in the process of developing now. So kind of going back for a second, what is GASB 34? I think Bill talked about it a little bit, but uh, I want to just reiterate this uh, is the Government Accounting Standards Board. That's what GASB stands for, and it's Statement 34. So this is comes out of the, the kind of government accounting world, and essentially what it was uh, or what it is, is it's a statement about how uh, state and local governments, uh, government agencies should be valuing their assets. So this doesn't just apply to the transportation sector, this applies to all uh, government owned assets, including you know, schools, school buildings, um, hospital buildings, you know, any, basically anything that a local government or a state government might own as, in terms of a physical asset. Um, the initial uh, statement was issued over 20 years ago. I didn't find the exact date, but um, it and, and really uh, this um, kind of raised the issue of asset valuation and, and asset sort of strategies um, to a lot of the, the minds of a lot of state DOTs and I think was a direct contributor to some of the early interest in the field of asset management. And in fact, if you go back uh, into the 2000s, there were a a number of NCHRP reports that were quite uh, interested in digging into this GASB 34. Um, I've got a, a copy, uh, our front page, front cover of one here, Report 608. Uh, there probably are some people on the call who are on the pan panel for that project or for Report 522 that was from 2004 that um, really delved into exactly what does this GASB 34 mean for us and how does it uh, help us think about the value of our assets and as I said, it was um, if you go back and look at those reports and look at the folks who were involved um, on the panels with those uh, reports, uh, quite a few of those names are familiar to the asset management community um, and definitely some connections between this idea of asset valuation and, and some of the, the work that's developed into asset management. We don't talk about GASB 34 in the community a lot today. Um, I think it's been, uh, um, uh, you know, in some state cases kind of uh, 
uh, superseded or, or we've had other um, approaches. Um, as Bill mentioned, this can be tend to be kind of high level um, to meet some accounting standards and is maybe not always um, exactly what we need as we look at asset management, but it's an important consideration, an important piece of information for us to know about. So how did we do it at Iowa DOT? And I think this will illustrate some of the concerns that we might have. So the the way that the accounting standards are set up is essentially what the uh, accounting folks do or finance folks do is they take our total capital program. So how much money do we spend on all capital projects in a given fiscal year? And they divide that by 25, uh, divide it equally into 25 slices. Um, and each one of those slices is applied to the next 25 years. Um, then uh, to look at what is our value today, we add up all of those 125th slices from the prior 24 years, plus the 125th from this year to give us a total uh, kind of book value, if you want to call it that for this year. I'm not sure I'm using the term book value exactly correctly there, but in any case, it's the really the value that we would uh, put on our assets for the current year would be really the sum of those 25 slices of the last 25 years uh, of spending that we've had. So um, the same 25 year lifespan is used uh, by our, our financial team regardless of the investment or the asset. So regardless of whether it's a, a microsurfacing treatment on a pavement uh, uh, or a brand new bridge, uh, they all get treated as 25 year um, investments. So, um, you know, this is a, a very simplified approach that kind of is useful for some accounting purposes, but I think it begs the question, is it really useful for investment decision making? Does it really tell us very much about what the needs are out there or what our total uh, asset value is um, relative to the investments? Um, that we make, and I'm not sure that this exactly does that. Now, I'm going to say that I don't believe that this is the only way that you can uh, value assets according to GASB 34. But uh, the other, some of the other mechanisms, my understanding, are, are, can be very complicated, and so, in some sense, uh, uh, gravitating towards these more simplified approaches are attractive. Um, it, you know, particularly in the, uh, as things were um, first starting, and it wasn't exactly clear what the value would be in going into tremendous detail. Uh, in terms of trying to value all of these assets in a more with using various depreciation curves and and other approaches. And so the simplified approach um, probably makes sense from uh, kind of a, a what was the purpose of this um, reporting uh, initially, um, but it does uh, maybe not necessarily make the best fit for us to evaluate our investment decisions. Or at least I think that's an open question. Uh, um, and, and I think we can all imagine what some of the, the shortcomings might be. So, you know, kind of, uh, you know, moving on to the what the asset management plan requirements are. So, you know, 23 CFR 515.7D says that state DOT shall establish a process for development of a financial plan um, and it shall at a minimum produce an estimate in part four, an estimate of the value of the agency's NHS pavement and bridge assets. So that was a requirement. It doesn't say how to do that, though. It just says that we have to do it. So, um, but clearly the, the, the purpose is related to the financial plan piece that, uh, that we've talked about uh, and that William and, and Bill both mentioned um, is in support of that and to, to help us understand the uh, investment that is needed to maintain the value of the assets. So I think uh, with that end in mind um, or with that objective in mind, um, we, uh, we're not sure that the GASB 34 approach is exactly the right way to do it. I'm not sure that we've got the right way to to really help support that that uh, even today, but we, we had to start someplace. And so what we've really done is, is focus very much on just what is our replacement cost. So um, we don't try to uh, do any depreciation to these assets. We just sort of say, okay, given our total uh, number of square feet of bridge deck area, our total number of lane miles, what would it cost to replace those today? So um, in our TAMP, these are a couple of tables that are taken directly out of our TAMP. Um, we took a look at, um, you know, how many deck, uh, square feet of deck area do we have on our bridges, um, breaking it down by what the DOT owns, um, what is the NHS, um, and then the, the NHS owned by other um, entities. We came up with an estimated unit replacement cost. Obviously, um, you know, bridges vary widely in cost, uh, but, um, 
you know, just sort of taking a single value and, and using that as kind of the midpoint or the most likely, let's say. Uh, same with the lane miles, um, looking at a, a unit replacement cost um, and, and a little bit of variation there, depending on whether we were talking about the NHS or the non-NHS. Um, but uh, uh, these are the values that we, we ended up using. We When we look at this across our entire state-owned system, we end up with about $14.7 billion worth of bridges and about 21.5 two or three billion in uh, pavements. And then on the NHS, uh, those are also illustrated here as, as required uh, in the in the federal reg, 11.6 uh, for uh, plus the 231 million for the for the um, NHS. And on the, the pavement side, uh, it'd be the 16.4 plus the 405. Uh, so um, that gives us our NHS um, asset valuation. But again, what does this help us do? I mean, this gives us an idea of what these assets are worth, um, but how does it help us make decisions? You know, one thing that's been interesting about this for us anyway, is just partially it comes down to just communication. We've had the opportunity to, to talk about these numbers a little bit, and I think it was eye-opening for some folks. In fact, one of the audiences that was really, uh, I, I think uh, found, <laughs> found this very interesting, turned out to be our motor vehicle enforcement uh, folks, those, 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 uh, uh, people who are, uh, you know, uh, patrolling the the uh, uh, commercial truck uh, traffic, and you know they tend to focus a lot on safety. But another big part of their mission is to help maintain infrastructure condition by making sure the trucks are not overweight. And um, I think that that helping them to understand that they were, you know, protecting, you know, these uh, uh, tens of billions of dollars in assets through the work that they were doing uh, was an argument or was a, a case that was was not one that they had heard made um, at least recently and I think <clears throat> helped them understand a little bit more not only the safety value that they provide which is uh, of course tremendous but uh, also the um, the value that they provide in protecting our infrastructure so um, but again it's a it's a somewhat of a limited picture because we still don't really know well what's the current state of those assets and that kind of came into play um, in a, another project that we were working on, um, as we've been working on our asset management implementation, one of the, the tools that we've tried to build is something to help us prioritize our projects. Um, and this was initially developed to kind of help with the project development process and to get us um, uh, into the ability to, to look at all the projects that are in the pipeline and where should we be putting our development resources to get those projects um, uh, that are most likely to be programmed, kind of. Uh, uh, accelerated or or get them research development resources. <clears throat> so it was really looking at kind of those early stages and a lot of times we didn't really know very much about what the project was actually going to do, but it was an interesting um, product that was looking at the pavement and bridge condition as well as freight mobility, the roadway classification, uh, safety issues, mobility issues, and, and other traffic issues. And really trying to combine all those to give us a single sort of weighted score that would allow us to understand how a project might prioritize against another. Um, however, um, as I said, this didn't really look at what the project was going to do. And that led us some, to some questions of what benefit are we really getting from the project? So that led to some work to say, is there some way that we could try to use the change in asset value um, as the numerator in a benefit cost calculation? So you know, going down to the project level, we can say that the work, uh, we, or we did some work to, uh, to estimate the current asset value after accounting for condition. And so this kind of is, is taking the, a little bit of a, a step forward in the looking at depreciated value. <clears throat> so we look at pre-project, what would be the replacement cost for that asset, but then we multiply that by an adjustment factor for the for the condition. And essentially what it would do is look at, so if we know the payment condition index uh, out of a, on a 100 point scale is a 75, then there were, um, we would know that um, that that only has about 75% of its replacement cost initial value left, and so it has to, um, has a depreciated value then. But then we would compare that to what an estimated um, uh, post-project uh, uh, value might look like. Again, that would be the replacement cost times some improved condition factor. So if we say that payment's going to go from a 75 to a 95, then we'd have that 20 points in um, additional um, value that would have been added and it would allow us to kind of look at the benefits of that project versus the cost that, that would be incurred. Um, uh, and, and for other benefits such as safety and mobility, we also calculated and, and dollarized their, their, their benefits. And 
So we did this for some projects. It was instructive, but it was also very labor intensive. And we had some, uh, I would say, lack of consensus on exactly what the best approach would be for this. Um, so this work um, has led to a lot of questions. We haven't been really able to successfully use it in the way that we had hoped to yet, but um, we're continuing to work on refining that. And in fact, I'm pretty excited about the fact that um, one of the engineers that, that worked on this project is actually on the, the panel for the project that Bill talked about earlier, looking at asset valuation. And I'm hoping that we have some lessons learned out of that research project that will help inform how we can continue to refine and improve this approach and, and maybe put it to work um, in our organization. Another thing I'll quickly mention as I'm running short on time here is uh, that we're also exploring how we can calculate an asset sustainability ratio. Um, and that could take a couple of different forms. Um, we've got some some work going with that right now and trying to look at, you know, how much is our agency investing or spending on our assets uh, relative to some measure of need. And that, that need could really be based on the depreciated asset value. So we're gonna be piloting that this spring and um, uh, hope to, to have more to share on that in the future. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and, and, and wrap up. Thank you again. I'm Matt Hobrick, um, Iowa DOT, and uh, have, a, have a great day. All right. Thanks, Matt. Um, I guess the 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 hook nowadays uh, to get people to stop is I'm going to turn my camera on as the visual. But thanks, Matt. We are right on time. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dave Schwartz. Uh, Dave is performance man performance measurement manager and transportation asset manager. That's a tongue twister. Um, as well as assistant to the director of planning and development at the Kansas Department of Transportation. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Dave. All right, thanks, Matt. Can you hear me? We sure can. All right, great. Um, and I want to thank uh, Bill for a real helpful rundown of those critical NCHRP projects. I think that um, my my talk is going to fall into that first project, and also Matt for his recap of asset evaluation. Asset valuation. Um, my presentation is going to be a little bit lighter uh, than the, theirs. And uh, as you can see on your screen, I'm, I'm giving you sunflowers uh, because this is the sunflower state, Kansas. Uh, I took this photo just yesterday. Uh, no, I didn't. It's winter here. Um, anyway, but uh, you may also notice the Ike logo on the screen there. And we in Kansas are very proud of our native son, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, the president and general. Um, over six years after he did, he signed the, in, the legislation authorizing the uh, interstate highway system, we named our latest uh, transportation program for him. It's called the Eisenhower Legacy Transportation Program uh, last spring. And we'll get to that later. I also wanna draw your attention to that Latin phrase there, ad astra per aspra. And uh, moving on, um, uh, you, you may remember there was a movie starring uh, Brad Pitt called Ad Astra. And yeah, it means to the stars through difficulties. But we had it first. Um, the uh, motto of the state of Kansas is at, at, at Astra, perhaps, but you can see it on our state seal there from 1861. And as you may know, um, Kansas was born in the middle of the Civil War. There were actually Civil War battles uh, fought to determine uh, the outcome of slavery in, in the state of Kansas. So anyway, um, but yeah, so at Astra, and it's very appropriate for the year 2020 as well. You know, we've come through a, a lot of uh, difficulties and continuing here into this year. Uh, but speaking of stars, so to the stars, um, <laughs> I, don't, I, I got to thinking that maybe I'm violating some sort of NFL licensing, but um, there's a star on your screen that's uh, Patrick Mahomes. And he, he's the quarterback for the Kansas City Chiefs and it's Super Bowl week, so you gotta indulge me here. Um, the Chiefs do play on the Missouri side of the state line, but Patrick Mahomes lives in Kansas and he has to drive on Kansas roads and bridges to show up for work. So uh, I'm going to take the liberty of talking about him a little bit here and maybe you'll even see a little parallel to asset management. Uh, what makes Patrick Mahomes so special that they're calling him the baby goat? And for you non-sports fans, goat is the acronym greatest of all time, G-O-A-T. Um, so Patrick has exceptional arm strength, but that's that's not all. That's what that's not all of why they're considering him maybe the next greatest. Um, he's one step ahead because he has a photographic memory. So you show him a play, he can watch film. He he remembers what happened, how how players react. 
He also has great vision. Uh, he he uh, not only can see things on the field, but he can actually direct defenders by how he positions his eyes. And he can predict what the defenders are going to do before they do it and adjust his game plan accordingly, uh, even on the fly in the moment. So we'll think about here, uh, you know, th those kind of, that kind of vision and uh, anticipating things. How, do, how does that apply for asset management? Um, last year, uh, Mahomes led the Chiefs to the promised land of a championship for the first time in my lifetime. I was actually born four months after the Chiefs won Super Bowl IV, so this was, I was very thrilled when they actually got to the promised land in my life. Um, what does that have to do with transportation asset management and, uh, and financial plans? Well, we'll get to that. But first, a little background on the Kansas experience. Um, it Really, I mean, I'd be lying to you if I said that I had anything to do with this. Um, it, it was preceded by many, many years of good stewardship of our assets, both pavement and bridge in the state of Kansas by KDOT. Many years ago, um, they, they came up with objective uh, management systems to, in order to make uh, database decisions and, and take care of our assets and be able to defend those decisions to the uh, powers that be. Um, so the, the TAMP happened to come in uh, near the end of our third consecutive decade long uh, funding program for transportation. Uh, we got it underway late in the fall of 2017. Um, the initial plan was completed on time by uh, April of 2018, and the final plan by uh, mid-2019, much like the story for the rest of you, except for some of the early birds like Minnesota. Uh, Patrick, back to um, Patrick Mahomes. And the, oh, wait, first I got to mention um, the time. Another, uh, I guess, uh, fortunate thing about the timing is that uh, in 2018, there was also a joint legislative transportation task force that uh, wrapped up their proceedings. And so we could kind of inform each other, the, the TAMP and uh, the task force, uh, based on the, the results out of our pavement and bridge management systems and, and how uh, the investments that we make in those would, would turn out in results and things like that. So uh, again, going back to football and, and Patrick Mahomes, in the Super Bowl last year, um, the, a key play that turned the momentum of the game was a long pass to speedy receiver uh, Tyreek Hill. But before the play, Patrick suggested it uh, in the place called Jet Chip Wasp. He, he suggested that to Coach Andy Reid. And of course, Wasp brings to mind our primary consultant, which was WSP. You can't spell WASP without WSP. And they produced the graphics you're going to see in this presentation. Uh, and the team from WSP was led by rock star Margaret Avis Akopio Sawa. So I, I wanted to give her a shout out there. Um, so what, did, what does our TAMP cover? Um, this is a map of Kansas. Um, you see the, the colored roads are the, the national highway system, but the ones that are in gray are also our responsibility as well. So the TAMP covers both of those. Um, but we do have to, to separate out um, what, what's on the NHS. The blue line there is the Kansas Turnpike, which I think really puts Kansas in a put, pretty good position. Um, it preceded, the, the Turnpike was preceded the Eisenhower interstate system by a couple of years, and it's totally self-supporting. So uh, it also connects the four largest metro areas in Kansas. So we, we capture a, a lot of that inter-metro traffic on the turnpike and also uh, the commercial travel as well. It's uh, especially between uh, Wichita and Emporia, Kansas, it's a very um, highly used freight corridor. Um, so moving into the funding sources, uh, this particular pie chart was probably never seen before we developed our, our TAMP. Um, you can note the little gold piece there, 8% for the Kansas Turnpike Authority. Before, we would never have considered their funding as part of ours. But since the National Highway System in Kansas, it does include the Turnpike uh, that's in there. So um, like I said, they've always had their own separate funds and done their separate things. But uh, a few years ago, it was moved under the direction of the Secretary of Transportation uh, by the, the uh, legislature. Uh, here's, a, here's a look at the cash flow for the years leading up to the TAMP. And uh, I guess the most important thing that, to notice as you look at our cash flow there is um, the line that says transfers out and those numbers in parentheses. 
the legislature has the discretion to uh, transfer out our funds um, so that you can see that sales and compensating tax. And we, we, we couldn't get it done with just fuel taxes and registration fees. But you can see by the end of the last program, the transfers out were pretty much eating up what we received from the, the sales and compensating tax. And that was an important consideration as we were uh, doing the financial plan. Um, this bar chart kind of shows that we are not siloed as far as the different types of roadways. Uh, the light blue is interstate expenditures. Uh, the dark blue is non-interstate NHS. And then the gold is the non-NHS. And you can see that that moves around. I mean, th this is just showing from zero to 100%. Um, every year, those bars would be in different sizes. But the share is not fixed by asset type. So um, these charts, uh, and I apologize for the small size, but um, th this is showing investment by the type of treatment. And so light blue is expansion projects. And you think about these, these are adding capacity, but it also adds maintenance responsibility. Um, and, and these are kind of the ribbon cutting type projects. Orange is preservation, which might be a little broader definition of preservation than you have in mind, but uh, it does include like full depth pavement replacements and bridge replacements. But still to uh, have that, the orange come out slightly less than the, the light blue expansion might give a lot of us indigestion. Um, moving on, so looking at uh, what came out of our pavement management system as for uh, that in investment scenario that, that uh, uh, Bill was talking about. Um, you, this compares the interstate and the non-interstate, and you know maybe we should have sized those differently because the the one on the right is actually two twice the size of the, the interstate. But still, uh, we want to make it readable. So you can see that on the interstate we've got a lot of um, there's a lot more reconstruction. But again, uh, those assets are reaching uh, their useful age. Um, they were a lot of them were constructed in the 60s and 70s and things like that. And um, and there's also a, a lot of uh, light preservation on both of those. Um, this is just another way to look at those. Um, and again, the balance approach, that was just what we called that particular investment scenario. But uh, this is the end goal. This is showing what, the res what you get for your investment. Um, we, on this interstate, we probably would have wanted a little bit more of um, the good, we've only got 53% there, and the non-interstate, it's at 73%. But again, this is the end goal, of, is a, a good state of repair. Another way to look at that is on a yearly basis, what is our gap? If, if you think of that, that dashed line as our target health for pavement, and uh, you can compare the different scenarios that we looked at, and the balanced approach tend to stay closest to that, that's, that state of repair that we were looking for. Um, the worst first you can see that lags behind and maybe eventually does get us over, but that's so far down the road. For bridge, here's these are similar looks at that. Um, on the left is when looking at it by percent of deck area in good condition, and uh, neither one of the scenarios made the standard of 80%, which shows we may need to reevaluate re that uh, 80%. And in the on the right is as looking at it percent of deck area in poor condition. So as, and we were still in the process of implementing the BRM uh, software as our, our bridge management thing. So we, we had some questions as to the accuracy of the improvement cost, but, um, but these graphs, you know, they help to illustrate the relative effectiveness of the approach anyway. Uh, just a little bit on the Turnpike, our partner, um, they make up about 25% of our interstate miles in Kansas. They're completely supported by tolls, as I said earlier. Uh, they're in the process of retrofitting a lot of their overpasses, the bridges that go over the turnpike for, for vertical clearance, they're, they tend to be a little bit low. So in order to be able to enable higher, bigger loads. Um, and they do have a payment management system that's supported by KDOT. We go out and collect for them and, and a lot of the same algorithms that are in our decision-making process they use for theirs. We also have uh, other National Highway System owners, uh, 10 cities, three counties, 171 lane miles, and 13 bridges. And just for comparison, 
KDOT owns 12,618 lane miles on the, on the national highway system. But we did want to involve those other owners uh, as we developed the TAMP in the first place. Three years ago this month, we hosted a meeting with the cities and counties, but the weather was so bad due to an ice storm that the governor uh, told state employees to stay home. But our consultant, WSP, was already in town, so we held a virtual summit with those cities and counties, uh, thanks to our IT people and things like that. So we uh, we had a Zoom meeting before it was cool <laughs> in 2020. Anyway, sorry. Um, so uh, once again, last spring, uh, the Ike program was passed. It just got under the wire because the, the legislative session was cut short due to the COVID concerns. Um, but it, it, it features a project pipeline, which allows for that flexibility to meet emerging needs. So, so once again, kind of like Patrick Mahomes seeing, seeing the field and reacting to it uh, in real time, uh, this program will be a little bit more nimble and, and allow us to change for emerging needs. And uh, again, that, that legislative task force, that was uh, part of their recommendations fed into this program, the Ike program. Uh, one particular thing I want to draw your attention to is a specific provision uh, for performance targets that were put into the, the legislation itself. And uh, again, it, it, you know, it sounds very familiar to what we've talked about with establishing uh, a tenure a financial plan uh, for the 10 years of the program. So uh, do we get a prize like the Lombardi Trophy, which is the if you're not familiar, this is the trophy that the Super Bowl winning team uh, receives. Um, well, uh, and this year the Chiefs are playing the Buccaneers, which is another term for pirates. So uh, you got to watch your bucks. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a, I'm a dad. You're going to get dad jokes from me. Uh, the pirates of deterioration and poor planning, they can hijack your agency's reputation. So our prize is a state of good repair which means smooth sailing, again, with the pirate analogy, uh, smooth sailing for your agency and for your customers and for your region's economy. And I believe that is it. I'm going to turn it back to Matt. All right, thanks, Dave. Um, now is the time uh, for your Q&A um, and um, so the issue is that I don't have a lot of questions coming in. I don't know what happened to people. I guess we, uh, Dave and Matt and William were just so eloquent and gave all the information that they could <laughs> that nobody has any questions about it. Um, so I guess I, I, at this point, um, you know, we don't. Um, if people do have questions, again, um, you know, ask them and, and the, the GoToWebinar Q&A functionality. Um, but at this point, I mean, instead of just sort of ending it here, let me just go to back to our panelists. Sorry, Bill, I forgot you. Um, is there anything, you know, given that we have a, another 15 minutes or so, anything else that, 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 that you wanted to add to any of your other comments, um, thoughts about what you're thinking of, you know, when it comes to, you know, if you're from a state DOT um, or supporting state DOTs, Bill, perhaps in the in the next iteration of TAMPS that, that, that you're considering or thinking about or, you know, that sort of thing? I know, William, you, you were at FHWA for a year, came back to Colorado DOT. Anything you're going to sort of change there with CDOT's asset management plan? Yeah, uh, as far if, as Steve, I, go ahead, Steve. Yeah, I'm assuming that William. Yeah, what I was going to say, Matt, I really like some that Bill said in, in company thinking. Uh, you're looking at your 10-year financial plan and you're looking at your pavements and bridges. I know through the years, as we do the consistency determination, et cetera, we get questions about the five work types. Now I wanna say, this is a, a critical part of developing your investment strategy as you're looking at the work types, the life cycle planning, how much money you have available, it, how do you use the limited funds you have? And we realize some states maybe the past year have a little less money coming in than they have past years. How do you best manage the roads with that money over the 10 years? And this is a, a critical step where you have the life cycle planning, your performance gap analysis, all playing together. And you know, like William said, 
it's all about the money. When you have your target and your condition, it's, it's a, I really like the comment Bill made. And in a comment that maybe was touched on, and that we really didn't see in so many camps, looking at the financial plan as being a key element of developing the investment strategies. Uh, how do you address risk in all this and resilience to the network? And I say that as, as a question. So, William, back to you. Sorry for all the interrupting here. Back to you. Yeah, it wasn't so much of an interruption as it. You pretty much said everything I was going to say. Um, the one thing, <laughs> the one thing that I would add is um, our initial TAMPs were completed in 2018, and during that period we may not have been working with the the data sets that we would have liked to have worked with. We, not, we may not have been working with the analysis uh, methodologies and tools that were ideal. And now that we have a couple years under our belt of collecting more information, you know, per requirements, uh, really, uh, looking at how do I take this asset management plan and begin to implement it. Uh, there's so much more meaning behind, um, you know, just that reflection of here's what we originally said. Now I got all this new stuff. So in terms of what Colorado is going to do is, yeah, we're going to really take a close look at the data and see during our, our target setting um, and, you know, not just the two and four year targets, but really that 10 year in the financial plan, uh, in light with Colorado did not necessarily have the work types uh, tied back closely to the treatments that we were doing on pavement and bridge. Um, and, you know, it's even our, our we, we still have challenges with that. Things are much more clear, but then you add in the risk elements to, yeah, I got to manage risk. I got to do it within context of work types. And now I have to build out all these systems so that I'm not only managing the Colorado State Highway system, I got to report out for interstates and NHS pavement and bridge. And so there's opportunities for us to improve our internal systems for putting it into the TAMP financial plan. And I think that's really our start is going back and looking at the data using those new analysis tools and actually using that as a form to engage the stakeholders so that they have more input, more ownership of what we put in the financial plan. Because when you're developing the TAMP, a work type is just a work type. But for your district offices, your planners, that work type actually translates to a project. It translates to money spent for your budget people. And so that's that's really what I, I'd like our focus to be on is that engagement piece so that our, our TAMP is between the TAMP development and TAMP implementation, much smoother path. Matt, you were shaking your head as in agreement. Anything else to add to what William said? Yeah, no, I mean, I, that's very well said. I guess, you know, what uh, I, I was kind of, you know, thinking about there too is that um, a lot of time, I mean, obviously a financial plan, is focused on the money, right? But we also need to not lose sight, as William is kind of alluding to there, of what are the results that we're gonna achieve, right? And what what is it we're going to actually provide through the, through the allocation of those dollars and those resources, right? So, you know, one of the things that we've been kind of uh, struggling with is as we look at, you know, future revenue forecasts and, and needs that we have out there, that there's a mismatch and, and we're not, um, we, we don't appear to have the, the 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 revenue that we might need to maintain our system, right? But that assumes that we continue to do business the way that we have been doing business in terms of the treatments mix that we have and the and the solutions that we have. And so I think it's going to really push that discussion of well, are there other things that we can be doing that can help us uh, get more life out of our our system? Um, maybe it's not going to give us. The, the system that we wish we could have, but maybe it's gonna help us get the most life out of that system at, at, the, at the least cost. And, and we're, we have to, we're gonna be forced into making some of these trade-offs. It put us in a little bit of an uncomfortable position, but as William said, it's a communication tool. If we are able to sort of lay that all out and say, look, this is where we are, this is what's available. We don't have the money to 
to do everything that we want to do. So we need to have a serious conversation here about trade-offs and and every uh, nickel that we can squeeze is going to be put to use somewhere else in a way that's going to help benefit our system. So uh, and and those stakeholders that we have that that um, that we're engaged with. So I think you know there is a lot of power in the communication tools uh, uh, of the um, investment. Um, plan and can help us really get a, uh, or the financial plan, sorry, and can help us uh, really have that that conversation in a more, you know, co uh, coherent way and, and get everybody engaged in helping to implement the strategies that uh, we need to in order to be successful. So we did have a couple, thanks Matt, so we did have a couple questions come in, I want, I want to get to these. Um, so the first one is for Dave. Uh, so uh, Karen asked, can you expand on the balanced approach and would there be any technical reasons why you may not balance uh, between the work types? Um, wow, it's been a while. Let's see. But the, the balanced approach uh, just meant that as opposed to doing all light actions and, and only doing just really preventative maintenance or, um, again, the, the worst first approach where um, we did a lot of replacements but, but didn't really touch pavements very often. Um, that balanced approach uh, was was just you know again uh, our payment management person could probably explain it a lot better, but it, it was just that. And, and I think that um, you know again going back to the the communications piece, um, I, I thought that we did a pretty good job during the task force of explaining to legislators and stakeholders and things like that that um, it it really is it's it's um, a very comprehensive approach that you have to take um, when when you're when you're trying to maintain your assets. You, 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 it's kind of like a juggling act. You know, we we, we want to keep the balls in the air. We don't want to drop any for for certain um, because that has uh, implications outside of um, you know the, the DOT, obviously. Great, thanks. Uh, another question. Um, dealing with maintenance, the connection to on the maintenance side, can anyone elaborate on financial planning for maintenance? Uh, difficult to separate this out between reactive versus proactive and planned preservation construction projects versus planning for patching. What are your experiences? Well, I can take an initial stab at it um, and then maybe uh, Matt or, or David might be able to, to talk about the how it played out in their states, but um, a lot of the TAMP financial plans um, really just focus on capital. Some do include maintenance expenditures, and it is really, so ideally, on the one hand, you want to include everything that affects the condition of the asset. Um, in practice, it's, it is really hard to uh, figure out where to draw the line. A lot, Like I said, a lot of states just drew the line at they just include their capital plan and didn't go there. Um, but I think the issue, the reason you might consider adding maintenance in is that in some states, a lot of work is done through uh, under the category of maintenance. And so we like to set definitions and, and make a distinction between preventive and not and reactive and between maintenance and capital. But oftentimes the lines are a little arbitrary. Like if the project's more than twenty thousand dollars, it must be a capital project, uh, you know. Or if it includes this action, it must be, you know, maintenance. So, so I think, it, you know, in good practice, you'd like to cons consider maintenance. It is hard, and in this this line, how to draw the lines is hard within maintenance, and it's hard trying to draw the line between maintenance and capital. It's just a tricky area. And I will point out that there is a ongoing NCHRP project that just got started. Um, it's NCHRP 23-08. I'll put a link to it um, here. Uh, but it's a guide for incorporating maintenance costs into a transportation asset management plan. It's supposed to be completed in 2022, so it might not be helpful for the next round, you know, of, of of TAMPS. But it is a you know a project that's out there, and hopefully will produce some some good guidance and you know research and all that good stuff that states and locals can kind of implement. But sorry, I, Matt, I, Will, William. I, yeah, I, I, I don't want to to argue with Bill Robert here. Um, I just have a different perspective, in that consider the work types. There are definitions for the work types, um, or more so guidelines that kind of separate out which each other mean. 
uh, just a reminder, those work types are initial construction, maintenance, preservation, rehabilitation, and reconstruction. And so me, I'm, I'm always trying to weasel for the easy way out. And so the question for, hey, how do you consider maintenance cost on this? Well, maintenance is a work type. And for the most part, what I've seen across the countries is that maintenance budgets are split out into different program areas. And those program areas sometimes take the form of the major asset classes, such as what you spend on pavement or what you spend on bridge. Um, the challenge there is as you're collecting information through either work orders or invoices or contracts, is whether or not you can split that information out between interstate and NHS versus everything else you do for the public roadway system. Um, by no means am I, I saying it's easy, but more so the things that you're doing from a maintenance perspective, it is easy just to call that the maintenance work type. Yeah, and, and Jim also raised the question of this issue of the work types. I, um, so, you know, some agencies have said, well, it's a work type, but our value is, is zero in the asset management plan because we didn't include maintenance expenditures. Others have said, well, they they classify expenditures that are maintenance in nature, but done through the capital plan or sometimes being called maintenance. So maybe maybe Steve's seen some consistency. I've not seen consistency in how it's handled. I, I agree. There There hasn't been much consistency, but the one thing that I want to point out is um, you, you've now had at least one cycle of the uh, determination of implementation. So you at least know what questions the feds are going to be asking you to prove that, hey, yeah, I'm implementing my, my TAMP. Um, now is the time to get your house in order, so to say, is to look at what can I do to optimize my output reporting in the TAMP on these things. Um, I, I would argue to say that for a lot of them, for the most part, we collect this information. It's just not stored or collected or maintained or published in a way that's very useful. Um, and by no means it, it would be an easy process to change software. Uh, software is you know, sort of like an act of nature. It takes a hurricane to move software uh, changes. Um, but you now have an opportunity to look at it as we're leading up to that 2022 TAMP to see if there are some quick wins, the changes that you can make. So we got time for one more question. Uh, this one comes from a local agency from the Seattle, uh, Francis from the Seattle, uh, city of Seattle, uh, but uh, asked, how do you include, I think it's sort of an interesting question also, how do you include communicate the financial needs for large cost assets, for example, bridges, that due to their age are due for replacement roughly at the same time without causing unnecessary panic among the executives? It doesn't sound like it would be unnecessary to be panicking about that issue, but... Um... I think, you know, what we what we try to do, at least for us, is to try to say, what are some strategies that we can employ that would help us spread this out? Like, are there ways that we can, you know, do some kind of a preventative treatment that maybe is not economically viable? It's not the right treatment for that asset, but because of cash flow, it has to be the right treatment for that asset. We have to make it last another. 10 years until we can afford to replace it because we have this other mega project that also has to move forward under the same schedule. So, or under the schedule that those two would have to go under or, or however many there are. Um, you know, so, so in some ways, I think we're going to end up, and I know this is going to happen for us, we're going to have similar situation where we're going to have things that are going to come due that we can't afford. And so we're going to have to, you know, get out the duct tape and hold it together um, until we can afford to replace it. And it's not going to make sense from an economic perspective. We're going to be throwing money at it in a way that's not what we would want to do. But we gotta we gotta make it work from a from a financial perspective. It's just just adding to what Matt saying. I think that's the great value of having a ten year financial plan where y'all 
training and trying to determine how to best do that. Right. All right. Well, thanks for that. Uh, I think we're going to have to end it there. I have 3.29 p.m. Um, so I want to thank everybody. Uh, Steve, thanks for being on. William, Bill, Matt, Dave, uh, very uh, engaging discussion. Learned a lot. Good questions. Uh, but don't worry. We will be back next week. Um, same bat time, same bat channel, that sort of thing. Uh, 2 to 3.30 p.m. Uh, Wednesday, uh, Eastern, Eastern time. Um, and uh, we're hoping for... Uh, more of these sort of um, uh, uh, th this more frequent schedule will help keep the conversation going. So we'll see how this goes, do a little feedback um, assessment uh, to see how people liked it and everything. And just a, one final reminder, if you didn't know about the other, the last two uh, mini series, you can always get more information at the Ashto TAM portal, which is at everybody together, uh, tam-portal.com, William. Got to make sure you get the tam tam portalcom There we go. Thanks, William. All right. With well, that, thanks, again. Often. <laughs> thanks again, everybody. I hope you have a great day. Stay safe, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Thank you.